Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. I am back from a fabulous trip to visit my sister in the Yukon. I was just gone for five days, but it was so relaxing. She lives on a farm outside of Whitehorse and she is 10 kilometers from a hot springs, the Eclipse Nordic Spa. So out of the five days I was there, we went to the hot springs four times. <laughs> okay. And Joni wants to say hi. Hello there. Hey. Uh, <laughs> she missed me. <laughs> uh, I was there for a knitting retreat on the Saturday. So, and that was fabulous too. Most of us were working on the same pattern, the stripaganza shawl, and uh, a few people brought other projects that they were interested in. So we spent the Saturday knitting, and then we went to the hot springs, the whole group of us, dozen of us. Lovely, it was just lovely. For those of you who are interested in the knitting aspect, I will add some footage and content at the end about knitting, so um, stay tuned for that. At the farm, the Aurora Mountain Farm, uh, my sister and her husband have a cattle, they're Ling cattle, a nice hardy breed, and there were three calves already born when I was there. Uh, they have pigs, Tamworth and English black. They have chickens. So uh, maybe I'll include a few pictures of their farm as well. I can feel that I have slowed down and I haven't been reading as much. I think that's a good thing because there is such a thing as too much reading and I'm just taking time to let my brain absorb things. There are two books that I had mostly finished, but the library holds expired on them. So I will just get them again later and talk about them later. But other than that, I have finished five books. So I will tell you about those in a bit. But first I want to mention that the Carol Shields Prize winner was announced When We Were Sisters by Fatima Asghar. It's the big winner. I was a little disappointed because I think if I would have been the judge, I would have chosen Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Meyer or even Brown Girls by Daphne Palacy Andreades. I liked both of those better than When We Were Sisters. Even though I admire Asgar's writing, there's something about the trauma that the three sisters go through in this book that it seems a bit voyeuristic to me um, as a reader. Just too much trauma for my taste, I guess. It's 7.30 in the morning and it's hard to find a spot that isn't in full sun because the leaves are only just coming out on the trees. So I think I'm gonna have to shift a bit. Okay, I better get to the books. The first one that I wanna tell you about was on the Women's Prize for Fiction long list, did not make the short list, and that is Bandit Queens by Parini Shroff. I had started this a while back and read 30 or 40 pages and then set it aside because other books had kind of taken priority in my interest. But then when Kit the Reader made a video ranking all of the books on the Women's Prize list, they had the Bandit Queens as their number one top pick 
and that was enough to encourage me to pick it up again and I'm so glad that I did so thank you Kit I will link their uh, channel down below I took the Bandit Queens with me on my trip to Whitehorse, finished it there. My sister read it after I left. She said she loved it too. It is set in a village in India and it is a combination of serious social issues and humor that just hit the right spot for me. I found it funny and socially aware and just totally enjoyable. Even things like the invectives that are used, um, an onion butthole and a lizard's ass sweat and a fried ball of pubes, uh, farcical but with depth to it, yeah. I keep having to shift closer and closer to the fence to stay out of the sun. All right. So May is Asian Heritage Month and uh, Perini Shroff. And the next book that I've got to tell you about is also by Asian creators, Amy Chu and Su Li. They're both Chinese Americans. And this is a graphic novel, Carmilla, the First Vampire. It is drawing on uh, a really old vampire story that actually predates Dracula. It's called Carmilla by Sheridan Lefanu. And excerpts from it are included in this graphic novel, but this is a, it's not a retelling, it's just kind of drawing inspiration from that, as well as the Chinese vampire stories. And it's set in 1990s New York City. The art is absolutely beautiful. The colors, beautiful colors that change depending on the emotion. And it's a lesbian story queer and sexy and it's also a mystery because young women are being found murdered the police don't seem to be doing much and so a social worker Athena who is Chinese American decides to investigate on her own because they seem to be connected to this club in Chinatown called Carmilla and it goes on from there. Oh, the challenges of filming outdoors. This time it wasn't the sun, but my phone battery was getting so low that I couldn't film anymore. So now I'm inside, plugged in, and I am determined to finish my Friday reads here. I've got three more books to tell you about, starting with this nonfiction audiobook, Your Brain on Art. How the Arts Transform Us. It's by Susan Magsiman and Ivy Ross. I found this so inspiring. Ah, I'm a person who loves the arts and loves learning. And this book talks about the, the neurobiology, the science that explains how it is that the arts enhance brain function and it is by changing brain wave activity and by accessing our nervous systems. So oh, yeah, <laughs> that's very exciting. The first part of it has a kind of questionnaire thing that made it seem a bit like a workbook and I was not sure that I was going to continue listening, but I'm really glad that I did because it moves right along into chapters, for example, on how art can be used to restore mental health and to uh, ap amplify learning and uh, yeah, just 
all around very, very good. The next up is a book that did not work so well for me. I was disappointed in The Berry Pickers by Amanda Peters. The premise is very interesting. It's about a family of indigenous Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia who every summer go to Maine to pick berries. And one summer, the youngest member, who's only four years old, goes missing. And what happens to her? We know right from the prologue that 50 years later, Joe and Ruthie are reunited. Uh, so it's not a, a spoiler. So the story is told in alternating chapters between these two youngest siblings, Joe and uh, Norma, as Ruthie is called in her new life. So we find out what happened to them. There's a lot of tragic things, which instead of making me feel more connected, just didn't didn't move me. So I'm not sure why it wasn't clicking, but I think it was the writing. I'll give you an example so you know what I mean, because maybe this writing will work for you. And this is Norma's voice. But some people, I have learned, are meant to read great works and others are meant to write them. Often, these are not the same people. When I was young, I decided that I could be the next great American writer. But over the years, no matter how hard I tried, I was denied access to that mythical space where stories dwell, waiting for the right person to find them and give them form. Somewhere between thought and ink, the stories held in my imagination dissolved into the ether. The journals that Alice suggested I keep were full of platitudes and preteen annoyances and the occasional reference to dreams or imaginary slights from boys or girls I thought were friends. Uh, and so she says that she cannot write. And because it's in her voice, it's just bringing attention to the fact that the writing is kind of weak, <laughs> I think. You know, the Amanda Peters writing is kind of weak. Norma becomes a teacher and she says, the need for conformity and for the attention of others can lead to a life of misery. I knew that half the people I taught with were simply going through the motions instead of actually living. So I allowed them to judge me and I judged them in return. And I was feeling pretty judgy as I was reading this. One more little bit. The faint yellow of a street lamp and the gleeful colors of Christmas lights from the neighbor's yard gleamed off the crystalline crust. Light is more vibrant in the cold, like it knows that people are stuffed away in their houses, miserable from lack of sunshine, and it needs to put on a show. Just... Uh, I really like the premise and I'm sorry that I didn't like the writing. Oh yeah, and one of the side interesting things about this is there's a side character named Lindy. The, the kids in the family, they have an aunt called Lindy. And it's not very often that I come across a character named Lindy in a book. This week I had two because there's a Lindy in here as well. This was the best book of the bunch that I'm telling you about. Oh, I loved this. Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso. It was first published in 1925. It's a Canadian classic set in rural Manitoba early part of the 20th century, so uh, May of the Moderns, I'm reading a book for that readathon that Margaret Pennard is hosting. I will put information down below. The story is about a farm family wh who is 
totally under the thumb of the father, the patriarch, who is uh, t overbearing and um, kind of evil, actually. The school teacher for that area is boarding with this family. So we get her viewpoint, and her name is Lind Archer, Lind, L-I-N-D, but affectionately she gets called Lindy. So here we have another Lindy, and she's a great character, and she's kind of a catalyst as well, because the children in this family, they're in, all in their teens, and they're practically kept as slaves. And the, the tension in here is, will they be able to escape from under the control of their father? And the mother is also under his thumb for reasons. And the, the writing in here, oh, I loved it. Loved it so much. Oh my God. Um, uh, landscape descriptions and the descriptions of the characters are very, very strong. So I have to give you a sample of the kind of writing I love. This is when we first meet Caleb, the father. Then the door opened. At first, Caleb seemed to be a huge man. As he drew into the center of the kitchen, Lind could see that he was, if anything, below medium height, but that his tremendous shoulders and massive head, which loomed forward from the rest of his body like a rough projection of rock from the edge of a cliff, gave him a towering appearance. When attention was directed to the lower half of his body, he seemed visibly to dwindle. He had harsh gray hair that hung in pointed locks about his head, a weedy, tobacco-stained mustache, and startling black brows that straggled together across the bridge of a heavy, bony nose. His eyes were little beads of light that sought Lind out where she sat in the lamp glow of the other room. He did not speak until he had hung his coat and hat on a peg and had washed himself at the sink. And next, I'll read a little bit of landscape. It was April, and the little buds were opening stickily on the elms and tinging their boughs with purple and brown. The cottonwoods were festooned with ragged catkins. A softness was unfurling like silk ribbons in the pale air, and the earth was breaking into tiny, warm rifts from which stole a new green. Yeah, that's the kind of writing that I like. When this was published, it won a major award. Uh, I have a good friend who has been urging me to read this since I was in my 20s. So it's taken me 40 years to get to it. I'm glad that I finally did because I just adored it. Ah, yeah, it's <laughs> so good, so good. And speaking of classics, I am jumping in to Misery May with a Thomas Hardy novel. I'm going on uh, Scott of Gunpowder Fiction and Plot's recommendation, Return of the Native. I decided to listen to it in audio, and I listened to samples of six different versions, most of them by British narrators, including Nicholas Rowe, and I found that his delivery was so smooth and even that it was kind of lulling, and I was afraid that over a 14-hour audiobook, it might just put me to sleep. And then there's Patrick Tull, who has more of a ringing theatrical delivery, as if he's on stage. And then someone who's kind of in between those two is Simon Vance. I've listened to lots of audiobooks narrated by Simon Vance, including uh, a lot of fantasy and the first Thomas Hardy book, that I listened to under the greenwood tree was narrated by Simon Vance. I did that one as a, an audio and text combo. So there was that familiarity. 
So I was a bit inclined to maybe choose the Simon Vance edition. And then uh, I really liked an Irish voice. Tyg Hines does an edition. Uh, very, um, I, I liked the, the rhythm of his voice and his Irish lilt. But it turns out that even though I was able to listen to a sample in Libby, it's not one that the library actually owns. And so I would have to get the library to purchase that one to add it to the Libby collection. In the Hoopla app, there was one that's published by Authors Republic that has seven or eight different audio narrators. And I listened to a bit of that. It was okay. But in the end, I decided to go with Wanda McCadden, who also records under Nadia May and Donata Peters. So I'm listening to that version. I know I'm in good hands. She has a polished sound, but it's also very warm. So that blend of warmth and um, theatrical emphasis that I'm quite happy with. If you ever do this uh, with testing out audiobook narrators, I'd love to hear about that in the comments down below. So as promised, now we're on to the knitting. I got yarn for this a stripaganza shawl from Custom Woolen Mills. I just ordered it online. They're in an Alberta mill that uses century-old equipment to process local sheep wool. And I needed a fine enough yarn for the pattern and I'd never worked with their mule spinner one ply before. I discovered that it is very energetic, meaning that um, the twist is a little too twisted. And as I was knitting with it, I had to keep taking some of that twist out because it kept twirling in on itself. So that was a bit of a challenge, but I really like the colors and I like the feel of the fabric that I'm creating with these knitting stitches. And it's a fun pattern because it's got a lot of variety. So it starts out with garter stitch, then we make an eyelet row and then brioche. Before I did any of that, I needed to wind the skeins into balls. And so I used my sister's Umbrella Swift and her ball winder. So you can see a little bit of that going on here. And if you've hung out with me this far in this video, I just want to say thank you so much for sticking with me and for watching. I appreciate comments. Love to interact with you in the field down below. So say hello. Tell me if you are a knitter and I will see you in the next one. And there's a, just a, a minute or two of brioche knitting at the very end. Bye for now.